Visualize a sizzling steak, the aroma wafting through the air, or a succulent piece of fried chicken, golden and crispy. Sounds tempting, doesn't it? But don't drool yet. Now think about the universal love for meat that unites us, whether we're huddled around a barbecue on a sunny day or sitting down to a festive holiday feast. Meat, in its many forms, is a central part of our meals, our culture and our very identity. Across the globe, from the sizzling fajitas of Mexico to the savory stir-fries of China, the smoky barbecue of America to the spicy curries of India, the aromatic jerk of Jamaica to the saucy suya of Nigeria, the enticing world of meats is as diverse as it is delicious. Each culture, generally proud of its traditions, and rightly so, adds its unique flavor to the rich display of global cuisine. But, like everything else in life, it has its issues. Have you ever stopped to think about why haters would pour dirty dishwater on this wholesomeness? If you've ever been antagonized by a meat police, then get ready. And no, it's not what you're thinking. The identification may include, but is not limited to vegans. We're talking about the clean and unclean meat legalists. This concept of clean and unclean meats is quite frankly ridiculous at best. Who gets to decide which animals we feast upon and which to leave untouched? We have our own bodies and should very well choose what we eat for ourselves, regardless of historical, cultural, and even religious factors, especially those factors that were not meant for us and have been outdated for several, several centuries. Besides, from a biblical perspective, there's a plethora of scriptures that debunk this idea of clean and unclean meats. Turning the pages of ancient history, emphasis on the ancient, we find some dietary laws in Leviticus 11. These laws meant only for a particular group of people at that particular time are often used in an attempt to restrict our diets today. In Leviticus 11, we find a bulky set of dietary laws. These laws, unnecessarily detailed, outlines what the Jewish people could and could not consume. From cloven-hoofed animals to creatures of the sea, the laws were specific, leaving no room for experimentation. Fast forward to the present day and we find ourselves wondering, are these laws applicable to us? Why would they? These were situational laws designed for a specific place and time and do not hold relevance in our modern context. After all, we live in an era of advanced food safety standards, nutritional science and a global food market. The need for such stringent dietary laws seems obsolete, doesn't it? Furthermore, religious interpretations have evolved over time, and many believe that these ancient laws were more symbolic, representing purity and impurity rather than literal dietary guidelines. Accordingly, scriptures declare all things clean, so we are no longer under these restrictions. It appears that we are free to eat as we please. It's that simple. The Bible in Acts 10 tells us about a vision of Peter's where Peter falls into a trance and sees a vision of a sheet descending from heaven filled with all kinds of animals. A voice identified as God's instructs Peter, rise Peter, kill and eat. This as a clear divine green light to consume any and all animals. And wait, there's more. We must not forget that the voice in Peter's vision also said, what God has cleansed, do not call common. Doesn't God himself have the power to cleanse all foods, making them suitable for consumption? Now let's turn our attention to Matthew 15, 11, where Jesus states, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. This means that dietary choices don't affect one's spiritual purity. We can eat what we choose because it's not what goes in that defiles us, it's what comes out. And if that's not enough, let's look at 1 Timothy 4, 4 to 5, where it states, for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. According to these philosophies, Jesus announced that all things are now considered clean, freeing us from these limitations, or did he? Now, hold on to your kitchen chairs as we use these very same Bible scriptures to find out where the issue comes from. Let's begin with the one used mostly as a reason to ignore God's dietary guidelines. In Acts chapter 10, the first five verses tell the story of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. An angel appears to him in a vision, instructing him to send for Peter. This context is crucial because it sets the stage for the events that follow. We move on to verses 9 to 15, where Peter has a vision of a large sheet descending from heaven, filled with all kinds of animals. When a voice tells him, rise, Peter, kill and eat, Peter refuses, saying he has never eaten anything unclean. The voice replies, what God has made clean do not call common. It's important to note that this vision was not about food, but about people. 
It was a revelation to Peter that the gospel was for everyone, not just the Jews. We see the vision repeated three times in verses 16 to 20, and each time Peter is left puzzled. It's only when he meets Cornelius and his household, as narrated in verses 25 to 28, that he understands the meaning of his vision. The unclean animals in the vision represented the Gentiles who were considered unclean by Jewish customs, but God was making it clear that no one is unclean in his eyes. Where Jesus states in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11, that what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Its spiritual application is that he was teaching about watching what we say. As we can see, there is absolutely nothing in this verse that mentions eating or eating meat. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.31 speaks about giving thanks. This is in reference to a discussion about the issue of food sacrificed to idols. These scriptures seem to paint a different picture when examined closely. In Leviticus chapter 11 verses 3 to 11, the Israelites seem to be scapegoats again. In this passage, the Bible provides detailed instructions about what animals are considered clean or unclean. The criteria, animals that chew the cud and have split hooves are deemed clean, but those who don't fall into this category, they're labeled as unclean. The scripture goes on to specify certain creatures like the camel, the rabbit, and the pig as being unclean. It's not a mere dietary restriction for the ancient Israelites. As much as it's a divine commandment with spiritual implications, there are practical reasons for this. From a scientific perspective, why does this distinction between clean and unclean foods exist? Let's sink right in. Clean and unclean foods, as classified in the dietary laws of the Bible, often have a basis in health and hygiene. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, or the pig in a blanket, uh, or the mouth, whichever you prefer. Pork. Pigs, for instance, are known to eat just about anything, and this indiscriminate diet can lead to the presence of parasites and diseases in their meat. Here's a secret. If you could get a penny for every breakfast with a strip of bacon included, take it, you'd be rich. The forbidden swine is a perfect example of how presumptuous appetite has overruled God's sensible guidance. Pork contains a microscopic worm called trichina, and if it gets into the system, the disease trichinosis results. Governments warn that there is no inspection for the parasite, and a Reader's Digest article stresses that there is no cure for the disease. There is abundant scientific evidence as to why pork is totally unfit for food. This isn't just about what animals eat, it's also about their physiology. Animals classified as clean often have complex digestive systems that help eliminate toxins from their bodies. Cows, for example, are ruminants with a four-chambered stomach designed to extract nutrients from plant matter and neutralize toxins. This makes their meat less likely to be contaminated compared to non-ruminants. Here's an incredible discovery. An experiment was done involving the application of muscle extract from various animals onto seeds to observe its impact on plant growth. When muscle extract from clean animals was used, it affected the growth of the plants. Conversely, muscle extract from unclean animals resulted in significantly impaired plant growth. This suggests that chemicals in unclean animals may hinder plant development, shedding light on why these animals could be considered unclean in the Bible. The blacklist of unclean mammals, according to Leviticus 11, is lengthy, but let's look at rabbits. What would make a bunny not fit for eating besides the fact that it's too cute to devour? Well, unlike cows, which have a pre-stomach for fermentation, rabbits have fermentation occurring in the cecum at the end of the intestine. This means the entire intestine cannot be reversed. Rabbits produce two types of feces, pellets and a soft form eaten directly from the anus. Yes, it eats straight from its own bum. This process allows for the re-ingestion of bacteria and fermentation products completing the meal. However, harmful secondary products also pass through the intestine, resulting in a higher toxic load compared to ruminants. The cecum in rabbits serves as a large fermentation chamber. Rabbits are considered unclean animals due to this digestive process. Shellfish is another group classified as unclean by biblical standards. These creatures play a vital role in their ecosystems by filtering water and consuming bottom-dwelling organisms. It's almost as if they are sewage filters. This means they can accumulate harmful substances and pathogens in their bodies, which can be passed on to humans when eaten. Hopefully we haven't ruined your appetite. Speaking of which, mind our manners. You've watched this video thus far and we haven't offered you anything. 
Would you like some piping hot water with the fin of an expensive gigantic fish infused with a well-concentrated urea tea bag? We mean shark fin soup. No? Okay, moving along. What of the birds? Birds of prey and scavengers often deemed unclean feed on carrion, which can carry diseases. In contrast, birds that feed on grains and seeds, classified as clean, present fewer health risks. However, science doesn't just support the concept of clean and unclean foods from a health perspective. It also recognizes the environmental impact of our food choices. Certain animals, like cattle and sheep, have a significant environmental footprint due to high emissions of greenhouse gases and land use for grazing. So, the distinction between clean and unclean foods isn't arbitrary. It's rooted in health, hygiene and ecological considerations. While modern cooking and food safety practices can mitigate some health risks, they can't erase the environmental impact of our dietary choices. Science, it seems, supports the concept of clean and unclean foods. But it would also be fair to consider that perhaps, we, just perhaps, uh, in the absence of the disciples, Jesus' apple fell on the floor and he redeemed it with the five-second rule. We just don't know. According to some traditions as well, this method has been used for generations to make food clean. By the way, did you know the concept of clean and unclean foods predates the book of Leviticus? Let's take a trip back into Genesis 7, 2. Here, the narrative tells us that God provided Noah with instructions on the distinction between clean and unclean animals. Wait, wasn't this long before the laws of the Jewish people were set down? Yes, that's right. Health laws were not ceremonial, nor were they meant for only the Jewish people, according to the Bible. Noah was not Jewish. The story goes that Noah was commanded to take seven pairs of every kind of clean animal and one pair of every kind of unclean animal onto the ark. Now, if you think about it, this distinction between clean and unclean animals must have been known to Noah, even though the dietary laws were not formalized until much later, during the time of Moses. This gives us a fascinating glimpse into the divine origin of food classification. So, when we talk about clean and unclean foods, we're not just discussing a dietary fad or a cultural practice. We're exploring a concept that has its roots deep in divine instruction and spiritual significance. Now prepare to be amazed. Dietary laws cross cultures. Islamic and Jewish traditions prohibit pork with similar restrictions observed among the Navajos and Yakuts. Iranians avoid fish without fins and scales, while South Pacific cultures abstain from eel. Hindu texts, such as the Code of Manu, share parallels with Jewish dietary laws. These dietary regulations reflect a cultural and religious heritage ingrained across diverse societies. How could this be? Some years ago, a survey was taken in a certain American city, and every person responded to 156 questions included in the survey. It was discovered that the prime interest of adults was that of health their health and the health of their families. Interestingly, it seems that in a time when we have more doctors, hospitals and medicines, that it appears more sickness and general ill health have been plaguing us. 1 Corinthians 10.31 proclaims, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. This scripture reminds us that our eating habits should reflect our respect for God's creation. It involves the physical act of eating or drinking, as well as the intention behind it. By choosing foods that nourish our bodies, we honor God's creation and express gratitude for the life he has given us. Genesis 1.29 takes us to the original plant-based diet when God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. This scripture emphasizes the first diet ordained by God, reflecting his intent for our well-being. Don't miss the implications of Isaiah 66, 15 to 17, which warns of the consequences of choosing unclean foods. It describes a future judgment where those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. Isn't it interesting that the swine is classified with rodents? This text refers to the second coming of Jesus and proves that the nature of those animals will not experience any change that will make them fit to eat, not even down to the very last day of this earth when Jesus comes. These scriptures suggest a mindful approach to eating. We should consider both the physical and spiritual aspects of our diet. By doing so, we align ourselves with God's original plan for human health and well-being 
to our amazement, we discovered that grasshoppers are fit for food. We'd rather they weren't, but we don't make the rules. According to these dietary laws in Leviticus 11, is there any food considered clean that you would never find yourself eating under any circumstance?